Evening everybody, this is Dr. Hack, and we're gonna circle back to our Scandinavian opening today, guys. And we are going to prove definitively, once and for all, you know, that noobs are the worst, pros are the best, and Dr. Hack is the one with the hairy chest. No, we're, well, that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna to try to compare the noobs versus the pros, and we're gonna figure out why our natural tendencies as amateurs um, doesn't do very well with this opening and why the pros natural tendencies crush the other guy this is a fun opening to play as black until you're about 1700 and it's not that fun anymore okay let's see this now you should know that before we did this video there were two others and i dealt mostly with the idea of time in this opening and so if i say something about this being you know a move that gains time and you don't understand what i said you should probably go back and watch those first two otherwise just hang here you'll be fine. All right. So when we develop with pieces, you know, our pieces and we can attack a queen at the same time, that's kind of what we're looking for here. And, and we're going to deal specifically with this queen to d6 move today. Now, let's get over here into the database, huh? Fix your peepers. We got this d4 move 89% of the time, the masters play it every time. But when you look at the amateurs, knight to f3 is the most popular move. Why is that? Well, you know, in the last one, we kind of decided that Black was trying to put the pawn at e5. And if he managed it, and if he managed to force us to put a pawn at d3, this really slows down our stuff, doesn't it? This bishop has a hard time getting out, so the knight goes here, and the bishop and the queen all try to pile through the f3 square because everything else is in the way, right? It slows down White's development in a big way. So we would really like to have free development with our bishops, we want to put him anywhere we want, when we want. So we would really love to have the pawn at d4 so that the bishops can do that. Now, why are amateurs not playing that move? Hmm. Let's see. Ready? I'm just going to click the top move a few times. Okay, so we're playing knight to f3. They bring out a knight most of the time. Then we play d4. Perfect. And then our knight gets pinned. Do you see the pressure building here? If the bishop takes the knight... People are going to feel pressured, right, to take back not with the queen because they feel like they have to defend their pawn. So instead, 60% of them say, hey, let's break the pin. And then more pressure comes to that pawn. Oh, no, right? So we defend the pawn again. And then more pressure comes to the pawn. Oh, no, right? And by the time we get to move, you know, eight with white or, or nine, the D pawn is lost most of the time. Right? This is 5,000 games, 75% of the time they've lost the pawn already. Ah, and we got to ask that we get enough for that. You know, we need three turns with the minor pieces in order to compensate for losing a pawn. Well, we have one, two, three, four in the game, and he's got one, two, three, four in the game. That doesn't seem like a big difference to me, does it to you? Hmm, right? So we have to go back again to this moment. When black played queen to d6, and we go, well, let's see what the masters do. Let's see how they do it. First of all, they're playing the pawn to d4 first every time, 89% of the time every time, right? And and, um, and what they're really doing is they're trying to slow down black's idea of playing the pawn to e5. When the pawn comes to e5, they want to be able to pull the queen over there so that when they develop this other knight, they get another turn. That gives them two turns now into the game versus the queen moving just back and forth while the knight's developed. That's pretty good. That should be an advantage of some kind. And we talked about this exact position in the last video. If you're curious, go back to that one. Okay, so then, you know, most of the masters are playing this one. Why in the world did they do that? Okay, well, let's see what happens if they don't do that. Let's play, let's play kind of a bad move. This is why to move and win. And the master did not get it right. Take your time. Check out this pawn up here. What would happen if you just started piling everything you had and aim it there? Knight to b5, the queen has to somehow defend it again. So she's got to move back to one of these two. I suppose she could give a check too. But that doesn't seem to do it, right? Because the bishop can just come out. And then we're winning a pawn and we're winning a rook. So the queen goes back. We attack the pawn again. How does he defend it? Oh, he doesn't. That's it. We've won a pawn. Maybe the best black can hope to do is to push this pawn forward too, 
to buy himself just enough time to remove the knight before you take this. But if we win a pawn in the opening on move seven, that's probably a good opening for us, don't you think? We'll take that almost every time. Okay, so, so probably the reason why he's playing this knight out, the reason why they're playing this knight out, is because if we were to try that attack again, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us time to put this knight out here instead of being able to defend that way. And we're gonna try that same exact attack. Ready? Knight b5, queen goes back. We attack it with the bishop. Black to move and defend c7. How does he do it? Oh, right? He's attacking the bishop and he's defending the pawn. He can do that because there was a knight in the game. So we think about why would a master play knight to f6 almost every time? And you go back and you think, well, you know, normally if you were listening to somebody describe what they were doing, they would say, I'm just, you know, contesting these two squares. But really what they're doing is they're building up a defense against all kinds of aggressive white ideas against this pawn with the knight going to b5. That's what they're up to, whether they knew it or not. Okay. And when we develop the knight, which we should do, we have to realize that the masters are now playing moves that keep the knight out of b5 permanent, like 80% of the time, the, the vast majority, right? What are the amateurs doing? Something else. <laughs> uh, well, they've got the two moves on here, but those it's only about you know one third of the time. Hmm. So what happens the rest of the time? They try this bishop move. That one fails. Why does that one fail? You guys remember this from the last video? Well, if we were to play the move bishop to e2 like the amateurs are doing, we'd be in bad shape. We can't do that. We have to play the move the masters are playing. 80% of the time they play h3. Why would they do that? Well, let's look at both moves. Let's look at the bishop capturing the knight and let's look at the bishop moving away. Where's the weakest place on black's half of the board right now? Somewhere where it's not defended by anything else. Hanging pieces, where are they? Right, we always have the rooks. And whenever this bishop moves, we always have the pawn. Well, hmm. Queen's aimed at those, so can he take our pawn? No, because we're gonna lose a rook for black. That's no good, right? So he has to take a turn and fix that problem. <clears throat> And when he takes a turn to fix his problem, then we can take a turn to fix our problem. And you'll notice that there's no cramped up stuff back here anymore. The queen's already out and we're gonna be able to put a rook there or castle there, you know, some way to defend this again. We're in good shape with white, just like that. And you can tell by the stats that we're in good shape. Black's not having a lot of great, great times in this opening. Not fun for him. So maybe he shouldn't take the knight. Maybe he should go back. And remember we talked about this one too. We said, hey, if we can get the bishop up here deliberately and put a knight on e5, this makes black's life miserable because he can never play the h-pawn. And so if we start to attempt to trap this piece, for example, he makes a nothing burger move, and we go uh, h4. If he ever plays the h-pawn to give himself space, we'll absolutely nab that thing off the board and make an absolute chaotic mess of the pawns over here. Two bad pawns, two attackable things. Nice, right? So he can't move the H pawn, so he's gonna end up moving the bishop down here and then up this away somewhere. And we look at that, you know, and we go, hmm, well, the bishop's there, we can capture it whenever we want. We're probably not gonna castle there. Come on guys, let's, let's be real. Which means we're gonna be developing some peace this time or you know maybe attacking the knight but probably developing some piece like maybe this one because this is threatening now to go here <laughs> which is interesting but not winning um and we're threatening maybe to go here i don't know we're threatening lots of things let's see what the computer says g5 a3 rook h3 this move is still winning. <laughs> this move is probably still winning, right? White's ahead, he's got such a great position. We can play just about anything we want. We can even give up the pawn and we're still ahead. How is this possible? <laughs> All right, so, so that's enough of that. So we get the idea that this bishop pinning move is not necessarily great. So then, you know, all of, most of our opponents are gonna do that. It's gonna, come, it's gonna be super popular for them to do that. So what happens if they play a good move? How are we supposed to take this on? 
Well, now that we know something, because you already do know something, you know the weakest places on the board right now are these two and these two. And that's the things that we aim for in this opening. That's it, you know? As we develop and as we aim our things places, we want to go maybe this way down the board. And so you look at the master's favorite move, and you see they're playing g3 a lot. Well, that's weird, right? Because this bishop already had lots of places to develop. But none of those places attacked the weakness. Hmm. And we have this bishop coming here now, which attacks a queen and attacks the weak spot. Nice, right? So that's why they would do that. Now, what would happen if they played the c-pawn forward? Hmm. Do they still play g3? Not as often, huh? Why not? Oh, because now the bishop here would be running into a pawn. Oh, just not quite as good. So now we can kind of get, we can get in their heads. We can understand why the masters are thinking what they're thinking, which is kind of cool. At least I think so. I thought maybe I'd uh, take this minute to show you one of my old games in the Scandinavian, of course. This game was played in 2017. Uh, against an FM in the Michigan bottom half, which if you don't know what that is, that's okay. It's just one of our big tournaments here in Michigan. If you ever wanted to come up and visit a tournament, that would be a good one. You should, you should do that one, right? Um, and Lester drove a long way to get here for this tournament. Um, and this was round one, 2017. I think it might be one of the last tournaments I ever played too, to be honest. Um, and we play a Scandinavian. Here we are. And we know that he could play queen d5, queen, sorry, queen a5, queen d6, queen d8. He chose queen a5. The reason why I'm showing this game after the video where we played queen d6 is because I believe that the, the next series of moves that he plays will translate to both of these moves. It will work the same. And so I'm, I'm very comfortable showing you this game uh, because I know that it would be the exact same if the queen had gone here. Okay. Um, so we play d4. We know this one, right? We've trained for this. And he goes, master's choice, knight to f6. Okay, and we're in with our knight. And he plays the bishop out to pin our knight. Now, I'm, I'm going to not play the move because I want you to be able to see into that you know, database off to the right there. Um, you see how they don't really do that anymore? This one, the c6 move, is, is more popular, and so is bishop to f5. And the old school theory, right? This is the old school theory, bishop g4. Uh, people don't play it anymore because the black's chances... Their practical chances, not their theoretical chances, right? Their practical chances were about the same to win the game. But white's practical chances to win the game were much higher when they do it that way versus this way. And so and so black slowly started to move away from that. And I'm sure, I'm sure Lester has seen this by now. And I'm sure he's also moved away from it. Um, but in this game, you know, it was still before that was apparent to everybody, I think. And he went bishop to g4. And you know what? We know exactly what to do with this. We play not bishop to e2, right? Edit that out of your mind. That doesn't, it's not a move. We, we need to gain time. And so we play h3 to gain time. Because if they take your knight, which he didn't do, then when we take it back, notice where the weak spots are on his half of the board. Ta-da, right? He's got to do something about that. Okay, so we come back and he's not going to take the knight, then he goes this way. And we know exactly what to do with this as well. Okay, and then the bishop goes back to g6, and our knight's into e5, and this is the game. This is one of those positions where when you reach it with white, you just know. You're like, I know I did okay here. I just have to play a good chess game from here. Okay, and, and I, I know this, this h3 and g4 stuff is so strong, uh, which is why I adopted it so long ago, and still play it. Uh, and so black decided he would play e6. Now remember, we're trying to get them to play this pawn forward. We'd really love it if they moved the h-pawn. So if we attempt to trap his bishop, sometimes they will, they will do something foolish, like move the h-pawn. Look at what this looks like. Do you, do you believe that these pawns are a little bit weak? Because I do. And, and think about what piece he's going to use to defend those things. He's going to be putting a king onto an open file? Really, right? Um, and it's only going to have one defender on each of these, and that's going, to be, that's going to be very tricky for him to figure out how not to lose this, you know, because this bishop's coming in to attack that. So is the queen, so is the rook. Uh, uh, right? 
Okay, so they really shouldn't play the H-pawn forward. And my opponent's a very strong master. He's not going to play the H-pawn forward. He's going to figure out how to make the bishop come to here so he can start working along this diagonal. Right. Well, if he were just to do it right now, can you see the problem with that? How can white chase the queen off of the pin long enough to take this bishop? Right, knight to c4. And after knight to c4, the queen moves to the only place where it can continue to keep the pin, and then we can chase it off again, and now it must go away. And when it goes away, we can take the bishop with the knight. So the bishop can't go to e4 right now if it wants to be safe. He has to do something else. And here's what he chose to do. Perfect, right? Now if the bishop goes there, there's no way that pin's ever going away. He can even play, we can even play a3, and this will still be pinned to the rook. Oof, right? So his bishop is now able to relocate should it want to. Good move. And I played to break the pin. Noticing that this, this piece was under fire by a whole bunch of stuff. This is not that difficult of a move to come up with, guys. Okay. And he chased my knight. And I said, oh, no. Right? I don't want to let him take that because I'll lose a pawn with check. And I hope you're feeling what he's doing. Every single move that he plays, he's making a threat to my position, isn't he? He's a very strong player, and, and if, I, if I don't notice one of his threats and I crack, then I'm just going to be behind. This is the nature of the Scandinavian, right? <clears throat> and so I know when they attack the knight, I've chosen not to trade the knights, which most, you know, a lot of players would just take the knight and be done with it. I've decided that I would really like to make his queen's life miserable. That's my goal here. And so his queen, if you look at all the squares it can go to, there is only one. There can be only one, and there it goes, right? Now it's in line with my bishop, which makes him uncomfortable, hopefully. He's probably thinking about that quite a lot. <clears throat> now, the very next move in this game is the most special move of the game. Because when I, when I play in tournaments, I spend a lot of time uh, home baking special moves into my openings so that they're not in the database, they're not in the computer engine, and they're still good moves. And, and I do that because I want my opponent to be in a tough position where they have to make a tough choice without having any prior study or any prior knowledge of that position. It's called a novelty. And I spend, I spend used to spend, I'll, I'll say, a lot of time doing this. And the one, one move that I found in this position that works really, really well, but is not on the computer list and is not in the database, <clears throat> is knight g5. And you see that the computer doesn't hate it. That's good, right? Um, if he were to take it, we see the problem immediately, I hope, right? We can just go check. And his queen's in danger because there's a discovered attack. He gets two knights and then we get a queen. That's pretty good. So we can't take it. So he has to deal with the queen being forked royally and also the bishop hanging. What do you suppose he'll do? Well, I think the only move he can do is to trade the bishops first, because that's a check. He can do that. And I had to make a very difficult choice here. Um, and I chose not, you know, the natural moves to take it with the queen, because that develops the next piece. But I chose to take it with the knight, because again, what I'm looking at is this piece. I really would rather not have it here unless I can trade it off the board. Okay, and I'm getting ready to play h5 and force that to be so. Okay, this is happening. And he moves queen to c6. He didn't give me enough time, did he? He's coming after my rook. Oh no. Well, we can't let him have a rook even if we get a bishop. It's just not good enough. So the rook has to move. It does. Okay, black to move. Can he take this pawn? It looks like it, right? He could just go queen takes. Or bishop takes. Hmm. What's the problem with that? Take a minute. <clears throat> Hopefully you, you can see that if the queen were to leave this position, if it were to be traded off the board or, or otherwise move, we could take the C pawn and make a fork between the king and the rook. Also, if black does nothing, we can play the rook all the way over to C3 and right through the queen, skewer to C7, and the knight can take the pawn and then take the rook. So black has to do something specifically about this square. Even taking with the bishop wouldn't be good enough because we could just step the queen out of the way and if the bishop moves, of course, we can then trade queens and take the pawn and take the rook. 
And if the bishop doesn't move, then we can chase it off, take the pawn and take the rook, right? So we, you get the idea. Um, he just doesn't have time. And the move that he came up with was thematic. It's something that you know about, that we've talked about. It was this knight move. Look, he's defending the pawn. Look, he's stopping the rook from getting here. What a beautiful move, right? Um, and so now all of the ideas that I had about attacking here are kind of out the window just a little bit. Hmm. And so now my best move here is to just chase that knight away. But now the rook can't quite reach through the pawn to help. That's a bummer. And he's going to make threats every move, remember. Every single turn he makes, he's trying to win something. You see what he's trying to win this time? Yeah, that's it, right? He's trying to make a fork between the king and the rook. Ouch. So I have to do something about that. Well, if I had been thinking very clearly, you know, the reason why I made the move that I made, here's the move that I made. The reason why I made this move was because I know that if he trades two pieces for the rook like this, I lose the rook, but I gain a knight and a bishop. I know that that's better for me as white. I know. It's theoretically better. It's easier to play with. I have more pieces on the board, more units of force than him. I should overpower him slowly, but surely. Okay. So that's the reason why I played the move that I played, but I can actually get that to that position by force. If I were to play the move h5, and now he has nowhere to put this bishop that's safe, and so he must do this now. And after we trade the, the bishop off the board, and after we get the knight, we've done exactly what we had hoped to do in the previous thing. We got two, uh, two minor pieces for a rook and a pawn this time. But it was forced to happen. It was much better. So the move that I played wasn't the best move. It was just a move that kind of it kind of does okay. And I want to say that in this position, uh, Lester played, first of all, a6, but then he played probably the, the dirtiest move anybody's ever played. And, and, you know, watch this. What is he up to? If you get this one, you're, you're, you're better than me. It took me like 10 minutes to figure this out. Okay. So he is... He's attacking the, the h-pawn. That much we see. That's easy. But I think the key to this is that he's pinned to the bishop. And his next move is going to be knight here. Check. And we can't take it because we'll just lose the rook this time. There's no bishop defending it. Ouch. Right? And, and the king's going to have to move up. And it's going to be right smack in the middle of the board. In the middle of a giant attack. I'm going to lose this game if I do that. Okay? And there was only one move that handles it. I could try to move the queen up here, but that doesn't handle it very well, right? Because if he still does the check, I actually can't remember why this didn't work, but but it didn't. <laughs> Let's play the computer line for a second. And it go, oh, and we take it back with the knight. Uh, you know what? It doesn't have anything specific in mind um, when, the, when the computer's playing this. It just realizes that Black's game is, is doing great. And I've got a lot of weak pawns that he can attack later. That's pretty interesting. Especially this knight, which can't be dislodged. That's that's super annoying. Look at that guy. Man. Okay. Um, anyway. So I had to figure out how to defend exactly that square. And the only move that does it, I found it. And the reason why I found it was because I saw that this was also undefended if the knight should go backwards. And I thought, he'll never do that. He'll defend the, he'll defend the knight some way. Right, and the knight will stay put because it's such a good piece. And then he moved the knight back, and I went, "La!" And, the, and you know, heaven started singing, and I was like, "Oh, something's going on. My my intuition says that I'm winning." What what? Right? Um, and I realized, as you probably realize now, that I could take this, and that would be attacking a rook. But the knight's defended by the queen, so we wouldn't be making a fork per se. But what if what if that queen wasn't there? And then you start to realize, or you start to notice, the queen doesn't have very many places it can go along this diagonal. If we could remove her from this square, then we would actually be able to win the full piece, and we can remove her from that square. How about that? She has to go somewhere. And then we're able to take this pawn, and we get a knight. And now the game changes. The whole game, the, the outlook, everything, right? Because when you're ahead in material count in a game, you have more resources than you had before. 
the idea of having to win more stuff, well, you don't have to win more stuff anymore. You just have to get to the end game now. You just have to get to a position where your opponent can't attack you anymore. And so I'm looking at these two pieces and thinking, those are the two attackers, maybe this one too. How do I get rid of them? And you'll see my, my gears change slowly but surely. We're tra starting to trade all the pieces off that can beat us. Now these pieces can't beat us anymore because it's gone. And now this rook can't beat us anymore because it's gone, right? And now this bishop can't beat us anymore because it's gone. And now we have to play an end game that's much simpler than it was a moment ago. Much, much, much simpler. And um, it goes a little something like this. Now, I, I'm not going to say this was easy because it obviously was not, okay? And my hope here was to try to chase the rook off the second row. And I think I did. The other hope was that he would just trade off the rooks and, and make two knights against one. That would be a very easy win for me. Um, he didn't do that either. He decided to go for my kingside pawns, which, looking at this position now, right here, I'm extremely satisfied, happy. This is a win, right? Because the rook can't re-enter the game. And since the rook can't re-enter the game, that's good enough. And he played knight down. And I played a trap because that's that's how I roll. And he decided not to, you know, his clock was way low, but he decided not to calculate so so hard. He was already hang, sitting back in his chair. He had already checked out. He was just playing the last moves of the game. He took the pawn, and then he realized his folly that, that he can't take that pawn. And as I took the knight back, he resigned. And the game might end this way if he played one more move. In case you don't see it. So this Scandinavian stuff, after the h3 and g4 moves, it's a very dynamic little opening. Now hopefully your opponents will give you an easier time than this one. This was a very tough opponent. But even if you get a tough opponent, you can still win these games, and you can still have a lot of fun with it. I do hope this helps somebody, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye now.